Hello, good morning. Welcome uh, to Common Ground Northeast. Like the video said, glad you're here and able to worship with our family uh, today on this uh, rainy Mother's Day. Uh, so let's worship together. Uh, stand if you would, and uh, we'll uh, worship together this morning. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away. Oh, glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When the shadows of this life have grown, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bar has grown, I'll Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. To a land where joy shall never end, I'll fly away. Church, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. One more time. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Turn your ear to heaven and hear the noise inside the sound of angels all the sound of angels songs and all this for a king we could join and sing all to Christ our King. How constant, how divine this love of ours will rise. How constant, how divine this song of ours will rise. Will rise. Oh, pray. Joyous noise, the 
sound of salvation come the sound of rescued ones and all this for a king angels join to sing all to Christ our King oh praise
God, we thank you for your presence this morning. We thank you that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are true, that your word is unending. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this room. God, that our hearts and our ears would be open to to listening and to receiving what you have to speak to us this morning. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. To all the moms, moms of children who are still at home or all grown up, moms who've outlived a son or daughter, or moms of babies they never got to hold. Moms who've raised kids all on their own or became a mom to someone who needed one. Moms of children who have wandered from God or the longing to be moms who are still waiting. God perfectly arranged each of you into the role you have today. His word recognizes you as capable, strong, and praiseworthy. Everything you do makes our lives more beautiful. Happy Mother's Day. Mm. I mean, happy Mother's Day. As we get going here, it's uh, a rainy Mother's Day, but still a good Mother's Day nonetheless. And we just want to extend out that celebration. Also, for those of you who this is you know, particularly a difficult time, extend that that. Um, that offering of grace that God does uh, to all of you. And so whether you are a mom, you have a mom, (laughs) or whether uh, you are still waiting, we just want to pray over you and say thank you for the sacrifice and all the things that you do to uh, fulfill that role in the lives of those around you, Um, and maybe even those uh, who you don't even know that you're touching. And so let's pray together. Uh, Lord, just thank you for the, the, the power of the range of mothership that that video just displays. And God, the, the, you, um, you have had a unique place in terms of how we engage ourselves familially. And from those who would be considered the matriarchs of our faith who have handed down uh, the blessing of uh, pushing back when there were oppressive moments like Shifra and Pua, for moments of the mother Mary of Jesus who wept at the foot of the cross, for those moments when Mary comes to Jesus and says, you need to turn this water into wine. And so, Father, we just acknowledge and thank moms and all that they do. So, Father, be a a comfort and a blessing to those who long. And I pray, Father, uh, that there would be an anointing of uh, even a crown of of glory to walk in this role with even more authority and power, grace and beauty than ever before. And we pray this right now over our mothers. And everyone says, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's so good to have you all here. It is a little rainy. I wasn't sure what kind of a turnout we were going to have, but we got a good few people in this room right now. My name is Eric. I'm the lead pastor here at Common Ground Northeast. I'm excited to be with you. Thanks for joining us. We have um, just a couple of announcements, but before we get there, I wanted to mention to you that since we are hosting in person and online, we will have a couple of moments where we stop, kind of like an intermission, and we'll either uh, ask you to respond here online or in person, or we will have you stop and discuss with those around you if you feel comfortable. You can also just sit in quiet reflection as well, but those are just creative moments for us to be able to stop and have interaction uh, during some of these moments in the last few months where we've been separated and scattered the way that we have. Um, we also have a gospel story guide. We're getting to the end of this series that we've been doing, kind of this epic series over the last few months since last fall, and we'll be ending it actually in the next couple of weeks in its entirety. And so if you wanted to have any of our resources, notes, and stuff, or wondering maybe where we got some of the things that we got, all of those things are listed there on a PDF that you can download at our um, website, cgnortheast.com. Well, we got a couple of announcements. One is we get to actually do VBS in person this year. So that's an exciting thing. We get to celebrate. 
We had an awesome online version last year, and it was cool. I get to see our kids running around the house doing little scavenger hunts and things like that that were happening. Um, But this year, it's good to be back together. Um, Those dates are June 28th through July 2nd, and it will be hosted here on site from 9.30 to noon. I believe we have a really cool partnership that we're working with El Shaddai in in that too, the um, Indonesian church that meets here after we do on Sunday morning. So that's an exciting thing that we have. Registration is open for kids. We also need lots of volunteers to fill in these spots. So if you're available, if you're able to help out during June, June 28th through July 2nd, the, uh, the volunteer and the regular registration is up now on our website, cgnortheast.com. We also, um, I think it's the fourth one that we've hosted, maybe off on the number, but we are hosting another blood drive here on site at Common Ground Northeast. And so June 8th is a Tuesday. We'll be hosting it again from 2 to 7. You can register. If you haven't given blood, um, just know that there is a massive blood shortage that's taking place, a crisis level um, blood shortage. And so we have been partnering with the Red Cross to donate. So if you're able to donate, we would love to have you come and uh, be a part of that. You can sign up at redcrossblood.org and then just search for Common Ground Northeast. There's a handful of sites, but it's pretty easy to navigate. Um, and then uh, register for one of those slots here. I'll, I'll, I think I'm, I'm eligible. I do every couple of months because I do the, the other one the super red, but uh, if I, I'll, either way, I'll probably be here and see you here. Um, if you volunteer, if not, I'll be hooked up to the machine, um, giving blood myself. So we want to do everything we can. I just Every time I say this, I want to point out how beautiful it is that for those of us who have revolved our faith around the blood of Jesus, there's something significant about offering up in a physical way, our love through giving of blood to others. And so, again, if you're able to, I know many can't, um, but if you're able to, we'd love for you to participate in that. Um, well, today, uh, as, we, uh, as we transition to the sermon, there's kind of a need to maybe do a, a recap. I know we've been recapping the gospel story in the six chapters, um, and so if you need a little bit of that, again, you can download that stuff. But today, I wanted to recap because this last chapter, this is the, the final chapter of the story that we've been in, and it involves the book of Revelation. Now, I've had a few people reach out to me and mention, uh, and even this morning, having some conversations, that Revelation is controversial. I don't see Revelation personally as a controversial thing, so I hope I didn't just step into something that's going to get me in trouble down in the long run. But we want to make room here. We already put our statement of beliefs up in front of you a couple of weeks ago. We don't have a hard set understanding or position in the book of Revelation. That's not what I'm here to do. That's not what this is for. We're actually here to see how it ties into the overarching gospel story in that it is the final chapter and the renewal of all things. And so what we're going to talk about today is how this involves itself in the narrative of the good news story that started in Genesis and ends in Revelation. So um, I wanted to put up this quick little framework. It's in Revelation This is one that we put up last week, Um, and and what I want you to see is we're looking at Revelation in four weeks. That's it. So it's a very high-level view of this last chapter. And the three, four things I want you to see is two weeks ago we covered chapters one through three, the intro um, with John and the seven letters. Uh, And the thing that I really wanted you to see is that John was, um, was given a message, a special message from God, and then he was commissioned to communicate that or distribute it, was maybe a better term, to the seven churches that were in what would be, we would consider now modern day Turkey. A major part of that message is be prepared, be ready, get ready. Preparation is a huge part of that and it introduces attention that as this stuff happens, as the things and the events that we're going to talk about today unfold, the question is asked, will the saints endure to the end? Will the saints endure? endure, God's people endure to the end. And then in part two, we went to chapter four and five. This was last week, and we just looked at the throne room of God. We talked about how in these chapters, John is given a vision. He's given this glimpse of the heavenly throne room where God is sitting at his throne, the Holy Father. And it's filled with two things, divine authority, the unmatched power of God, the the, the rulership of God the Father on this earth. And we call it like this cosmic control room where everything is being offered from, and there's other people in this room. But we also see it, not just the power, but that there is this divine, massive worship going on. And I don't even know what to compare it to other than we talked about, you know, if you've been to a large-scale event like the Super Bowl or even um, a, better, a better one is the World Cup because there's so many people and often they have these chants that are in unison together. And so there's these chants that are happening, these songs, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and was and is to come. And there's a few others. And so you have this massive 
divine authority and this massive divine worship taking place of God. And in this room, there is a scroll. And this scroll has seven seals. And what happens is we realize that the conclusion, the storyline that unfolds the conclusion of history as we know it, is contained in this scroll. And God the Father says, he introduces a new tension. He says this, who is worthy? Actually, the angels are the ones saying this, but who is worthy to open this scroll? And so John, who's the person that's sitting in this vision, looking at this, is watching it. And what he realizes is there is nobody able to open this scroll. And he starts to weep. He is so concerned. He's so afraid. Nobody is here to deliver us from the pain, the tears, all of the, 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 uh, the darkness and sin that entered into our world when Adam and Eve sinned. Nobody is able to undo that. And an elder comforts him. One of the other people in the room comforts him. And he says this, auditorial and, uh, auditorially, and that's important, the Lion of Judah is worthy. And so he's expecting the Lion of Judah. He turns, and what he sees instead is a slain lamb. And that's important because what we realize is that the military power of God does not come by force, not war, but by sacrificial love, by giving up his life, his shed blood for the sake of humanity to be redeemed to God. And now we're jumping into today. And we're going to look at chapters 6 through 20. And one of the questions that should arise just as you're looking at this is, hold up, we did like one, two, three chapters, and we did four and five chapters, and now you're just going to do 6 through 20 all in one stint, right? And so the question is, what, do, what is that? What do you, why did you do that? And I've got another um, slide that I want you to see really quick that will kind of put this in picture form almost. And it's this, uh, it's actually a question mark one. You just got the answer before you got the question. Boom. All right, hopefully you didn't memorize that in the two seconds it was up there. But if we have intro seven letters, throne room four and five, what's going to happen in all of these things? Because we know at the end, the last two chapters, and we'll cover that next week, are just these two chapters where we realize we get to see the way in which all things are made new and brought back into the perfection that it was meant to be. And so what happens between chapters six through 20? What is, what is all of that supposed to tell us? And while these chapters contain a lot of detail and information about the events leading to the final judgment and the emergence of the new heavens and the new earth, while we could break this down into 10, 12 chapters even, just these 6 to 20. And while there's lots of cool things in there, multiple ways of judgment, seven major symbols, there's two significant wars, and I'm going to summarize those things today. While all of these things are there, and while the timelines are often debated inside of the Christian world, that entire section is together because it all serves one singular purpose, and that is they describe the events that lead up to the emergence of something new, the birth of something. They are meant to warn us. All of these serve the same purpose in its entirety as a chunk to help us to know that we are to understand that something is coming. And so this section describes in higher detail what will be inside of it. And you can put that next slide up. And I just use squiggly lines. That was my uh, little symbol for messiness. And, and tribulation, and trial, and persecution, it's going to actually be a very difficult time that we're going to walk through if you're alive during this time, or maybe we're in it now, depending on the timeline that you would describe uh, to, uh, in, in your history, in your tradition. But what I want you to see is that it's filled with tension. And there's a new question being asked that's the same question from before. Even now, with the trial, the persecution, the tribulations, will the saints, the people of God, remain faithful. And it's not going to be easy. And while Jesus was on earth, he gave us a glimpse of some portions of the, what this is going to look like when it happens. And he describes them in Matthew 24. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew 24 right now. Um, oddly enough, and I'll, I'll out this right now just so you have it um, from the beginning, I am not going to actually read from any of those 6 through 20 chapters today, uh, which is maybe weird. But I'm going to summarize those because there's just so much. But what I want you to see is that there were some things happening before that takes place um, and even connected to Jesus, even connected to the Old Testament. And so I would invite you to read 6 through 20. Um, and we also have a, a resource online right now to help you kind of frame that and understand it better. But today, this is what we're, what we're looking at. Matthew 24, Jesus, in a couple of moments, likens these events 
to one, to a couple of metaphors. One is a fig tree. And that fig tree metaphor, actually, if you read those 6 through 20 chapters, will play itself out again. Jesus is teaching his disciples. They're walking around. They're in front of a temple. And they say, when will the end of all things come? They're wondering similar questions as us. When is all of this going to happen? And so he likens it to a fig tree. He says, as soon as the twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Then the part that I want us to read, this is the second analogy. He uses a birth analogy. Now, I want you to know that I did not intend for the birth analogy to happen on Mother's Day, okay? For a couple of reasons. I'm not that cheesy to just line those things up, right? Just because that would be a kind of a goofball thing to do, or maybe a fun thing to do. I don't know. But there's a couple of difficult birth moments that we're going to deal in in this um, that, uh, that I would not have necessarily matched up on this day. But I want you to know that we're aware of it. We're not going to stay on that or dwell on that. But there is a jumping off point inside of the scriptures that I want us to get to. But he uses this analogy. We did this. We put together this um, framework months ago. Um, and it just happens to fall today. And this is what I want you to see. Matthew 24, 4. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am Messiah and, I will, de- and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation. And kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes all over in various places. All these things are the beginning of what? Say it with me. Birth pains. So this is Jesus referring to a portion, not the whole, but a portion of the end things to come. Part of this puzzle is being given to us. And if you read Matthew 24, he gives you other parts of it as well. And it connects us. The reason this one analogy, this metaphor, this picture is important is because it does a lot of things. It accomplishes all kinds of things. So this is one that I want you to see. It connects us to Eve and the consequences she was given in the garden. It connects us to creation. It draws from the very earthy, natural experience of a healthy childbirth, which is relatable and somewhat common in our culture, right? And it's also understood from generation to generation to generation. The birth process is present from culture to culture to culture. They might look at it different, but every generation, every culture can relate to this metaphor. Now, I don't have a lot of fig trees in uh, Phoenix where we came from, so I may not get that metaphor. But I'm going to get this one. And this pain that we see, the, the pain that we see on this side of Genesis, right, post-rebellion, is a necessary, as we see even in a healthy labor process, is a labor-intensive event that leads eventually to what? Something good. A baby. And there are nine months of preparation built into this analogy. And most of us, even if you've never had a child, you know some of these ideas. You understand these concepts. And this is what I want us to actually focus on for our first reflection moment. What type of preparations are common in our culture? Uh, and I want to stress that in our culture. And even that is diversified maybe. Um, I would even say if you, um, if you haven't seen it, there's this documentary called Baby. Uh, I think it's just straight up baby or babies, plural. Um, and it shows different, the birthing process from conception all the way to, I think, the first year of the child. All over the world, in different countries, and how different all of those processes are as we think and, and focus and value different things in all of these cultures. I would invite you to check it out. It's really um, quite a powerful documentary. But in our culture, in America, maybe just even your household, what did it look like? What would it look like? Or speculate, what could it possibly look like? whether you've had lots of kids or none at all, to prepare for a baby coming into the house. Instead of a quiet reflection or discussion, I actually want us to just shout those things out. You can feel free to jump in. If you're online, you can also put those things um, online on the chat right now. What is one thing you would think of? How do you prepare for a baby coming into a household? Now, some of you who've done it should have a couple of answers right off, right? What happens? Diapers, Diapers, right? Lots of diapers. Diapers. Different size diapers. <laughs> I think that was maybe an ambush for me. I didn't catch all of that, right? Tiny, tiny diapers, big diapers. What else? All the equipment. You can have a car seat, yes. And it has to be updated, <laughs> apparently. And you got cribs, right? What else? Stroller. Want to have something to push the baby around in? Anything else? 
say yours real quick. The room. I, yeah, you want to get paint, you paint, and you got to pick colors, right? I didn't realize that was such a thing when we had kids. Someone said something over here. Baby showers. There's celebration involved, right? There's some celebrations along the way. Now, what else can you prepare for? Not just having the baby coming into the house, but you also maybe take a class or two to help prep you for the labor, right? And so what are examples of that? How do you prepare for the labor process? Breathing exercises. Perfect. Lamaze. I don't know if there's other ones or if they're all just kind of lumped under that. I'm not as familiar. But what else? Yeah. What, say it again. Hand massages. <laughs> okay, specifically. We took a class uh, with our first, and uh, there was a point where they turn off the lights, you know, to kind of mimic the serene moment <laughs> of childbirth. And people were getting pretty intimate in that room. It actually turned into me and my wife making lots of jokes about how uncomfortable we were in this room. Uh, but you got to learn some, some things, some tools, right? Comforting techniques. The partner has to learn how to be a good coach, right? Anything else? Doctor appointments, yeah, pictures. So if, you, if you want the gender reveal, there's all of these things that come before that. You learn to push, right? There's actual technique for that, that as a man, I was completely under, uh, uh, informed, under-informed about. And so this is what I want you to do. And, and you maybe even will read books. What to expect when you're expecting is kind of a common one. Now it's in an app form, so you can tell if your child is the size of a walnut or an avocado or some other delicious edible item and you might even prepare a, a bag, some sort of an overnight bag for when you're actually in that process. There's lots of ways that we prepare uh, to be as ready as we can get, right? You just try to get yourself as close to possible as ready. And we understand that before the things take place, before God renews all of creation, before the events that lead up to the birth of the new heavens and the new earth, we are being asked to prepare something. We are being asked to prepare ourselves we are being asked to train our hearts and our minds to be able to endure something. We are being told, warned, hey, this is coming. And I want you not to be ambushed by the things that are happening. And so you might want to read a book. Well, what do you do? Is there a book? I mean, we, ha we have one. What else might you do? You, you would condition yourself to endure the pain, the trials, etc. as you wait for the coming of the new heavens and new earth. You would ready your heart to receive. And I love this thought. I think it came out of one of our staff discussions. What would it take for you to be uh, very comfortable and at home in the new heavens and new earth? How can you get your heart and your mind ready so that it's familiar? You just step into the new heavens and new earth and you're like, oh, I like this place. I've been here before. I, I feel like we've, been, we've prepped for this. This seems familiar to me. What's in your theological overnight kit to help you understand and prepare for it? And some of you might say, I don't have any clue what I would do. Some of you watch The Walking Dead and you're like, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to stockpile food. I know exactly which weapon. I'm going to stock up on all the supplies that I need, every non-perishable item. In fact, some of you maybe had a taste of it in March of last year because you realized I might need to, pre to, to prep my house for a few things, Right? And when Jesus uses this birthing metaphor, he's wanting us to, in a similar way, take stock. The time isn't quite here, but it is near. This baby's coming. This new heavens and new earth. And there's a labor pain process between there and the ending, kind of. But Jesus pulls, when he says in this in verse 24, he pulls from the prophetic tradition of Israel's history in Isaiah 26. I want to invite you to turn to Isaiah 26. In yet another redemptive moment from the previous cycle, we saw as God's people failed and were redeemed. Failed and redeemed over and over. This is another part of that redemptive moment where Jesus uh, uses the history of Israel and does correctly what they failed to do. Isaiah 26, starting in verse 16, says this. Lord, they came to you in their distress. And when you disciplined them, they could barely whisper a prayer. As a pregnant woman about to give birth rise and cries out in her pain, so were we in our presence, Lord. Now I want you to see we're in a lament phase. This is the people of Israel talking about themselves in third person. And they're about to be a little bit more specific. Verse 18. We were with child, we writhed in labor, but we gave birth to wind. We have not brought salvation to the earth, and the people of the world have not come to life. 
So once again, it's lament. And I want you to know the part in history that they're hanging out in is exile. When this is being written in this moment, we're talking about an exile moment. And so what they are looking at is saying, God, you promised some things to us. And, and we have endured the pain, right? He's utilizing this birth analogy, recalling this sense that God did not come through with his promise. We walked through the trials. We've gone through the difficult seasons. We were harassed by the nations. We have been walked on and walked through unimaginable things. But we didn't get to see the fruit and the joy. We didn't get the baby at the end of the labor, which is the deliverance and the redemption that you promised us, God. And so what are they drawing from? They're drawing from their history, right? So think about in this moment, they have been given the land, the promised land, the, milk of, the land of milk and honey, a very physical place, right? They have been given the land of Canaan at one point, and they were building temples, right? And, and building their lifestyle, building themselves into a nation, but then they walked away from God, and he sent them into exile. Their temple has been destroyed at this point. So they're, again, lamenting God, give us back the things that you promised. Not just that, you caught inside of that verse. We have not brought salvation to the earth and the people of the world have not come to life. They were blessed to be a what? A blessing. So it's not just we want the blessing. You're supposed to do some things on earth through us, God. And so where is it? And they're using poetry, pouring out their disappointment to God. They liken it to this difficult moment in childbirth. Now, of course, um, they're asking God once again for a very physical deliverance. They want God to repay their enemies with judgment. They want him to overthrow Babylon, which is who has taken them captive. So they get rewarded on the other side by getting the temple back. And eventually they do get to rebuild the temple, a land flowing with milk and honey. God, give birth to a tangible physical manifestation of redemption. When Jesus mentions this in Matthew 24, come back to the first century with me. He is recalling this birth metaphor from Isaiah saying, don't give up. God didn't forget you. I know that promise was there. I know you feel like it hasn't been answered, but it's still on its way. Don't give up. Stay in a, mo- in, a, in, a, in a mindset of hope. God hasn't forgotten, and it's closer than you think, but it's going to look different than you thought. Now, this has a, a possibility of being somewhat confusing. I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence, but even, you know, just as I was digging through this over the last couple of weeks, I felt like a picture might be helpful to give us an understanding of what this looks like. I might be out of order, sorry if, if I put it in out of order. So these are my little symbols I copied and pasted. I, I know you love the artwork, so you can thank me for that later. But the picture is this. There are labor pains, which I gave a picture of a woman in a hospital. Obviously, first century and ancient times, they were not this sterile clean or, um, or put together. But the idea is we go through the labor and we get the baby. The Jewish people are using this as a metaphor. God, come into the tension and use force, use conflict to give us, and that was the best thing I had for a land flowing with milk and honey, all right? Give us the land, give us the place that we've asked for, but what Jesus is about to do is to say there is going to be tension, there is conflict, I am going to battle on your behalf, but it will be as a lamb slain. And the thing you get is different than you thought. It's a new heaven and new earth. All right, now this is important. Keep this in mind as this unfolds because there's going to be one more twist that takes place here. Jesus is speaking on a spiritual level and the conflict or the trials, persecution, tribulation, and the battle that he undergoes through the crucifix. The baby is the new heaven and new earth. But he is also recalling another moment also found in Isaiah. This will be the last one I ask you to turn to. Isaiah 66, 7 and 8. Isaiah 66, 7 and 8. And we'll have the words up there again. Or the Bible verses up there. Now watch what happens here. Directly connecting these two, Jesus is recalling both. Before, before she goes into labor, she gives birth. Before she goes into labor, she gives birth. Before the pains come upon her, she delivers a what? son who has ever heard of such things who has ever seen something like this now you should in your mind think hold up god that doesn't make any sense 
That doesn't have any bearing on the actual physiological nature of birth. I can't have the baby before the labor. That's completely backwards. God, do you not know how biology works? And he's like, of course I do. I made biology, right? It's out of order. In other words, if you're going to get the land of milk and honey, remember the analogy, the picture represents what the, what, what the people in Isaiah were wanting. If we're going to get this land, if we're going to get salvation, if we're going to get redemption, we're going to have to get, uh, if, if we're going to do that, we're going to have to get these things by you going to war on our behalf. There's going to have to be conflict and labor before we get that reward. And if the baby referred to in the metaphor is the new heaven and new earth, what, he's, what we're asking for is God come to battle on our behalf. But he's like, I'm going to do it before the labor, before the pains come. And so God's saying, I know this is backwards. I know it. He said, that's why I said it for you. Has anyone heard such a thing like this? Has anyone ever seen anything like this? Because it's extraordinary. It's miraculous. It's new. It's out of the ordinary. It's different for his people. And he is calling them to place their hope in him. But he is also saying, I'm going to give you the kingdom early. I'm going to give you the likeness of the new heavens and the new earth, and it will come before you actually encounter the trials. And what he's referring to here is these events that take place in the book of Revelation. I'm going to give you a little bit of that before the fullness comes, and his name is Jesus Christ. Right? This is one of those moments where the, where the churchy answer is there. What's the answer? Jesus, right? Jesus didn't wait. Jesus is the redemption. He is the presence of heaven in their midst. He didn't wait. He brought the kingdom to us before the labor pains were ever encountered in their fullness. And that's why he's saying over and over, the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus came to earth before the labor, before the last of the trials, the final persecution, the struggle, which is the conflict we read about in the, Genesis, or in the Revelation account. Now, I am going to summarize chapters 6 through 20 very quickly. I cannot stress, even just as I was studying it this last week, how difficult it was for me to say, I'm going to talk about that and not that. I don't have time to talk about this. I wish I could hit on this. But there just isn't time on a Sunday morning. And so I want to ask you to read chapters 6 through 20. Um, the Bible Project, which is a really great resource. If you haven't heard of them, they have a really great summarized version. It helps you to frame those things better. You can find it on YouTube. Just look it up. It's two videos, um, and, and it's a very well, uh, uh, very um, uh, unified kind of understanding without really picking a side in terms of dates and times and those things that people speculate on. So this is it. First, there are three sets of seven warning judgments, three sets of seven things that take place. And what happens is, if you remember, the one who is worthy to open the scroll was Jesus, the lamb that was slain, and he begins to open that scroll with all of these events written on it, and he takes apart one seal at a time. And so there's seven events that take place with every one of those. Now, some people believe that these three sets of seven are a little, literal sequence of events, and then there's a debate internal of that community that would say that, they, that it happens, has either happened in the past, and we're actually walking through these events now, it is happening in the present, or it has yet to happen in the future. Now, others believe that all of these three depictions, the three sets of seven, are all actually the same event, just being told from three different perspectives, all right? All of them agree on this that it takes place between Jesus' resurrection uh, and the eventual return, and that seven, the reason you see the number seven is that it is a number for completion, and that completion is being communicated over and over in some way, bringing the span of history to its conclusion. All right, so three sets of seven take place over and over. That's the bulk of that section of Scripture. Then uh, the next part jumps in. Well, actually, let me give you just a little bit of detail. Seven seals of the seven scrolls, only opened by Jesus, who's the Lamb that is worthy. They're given to us. There's one, there, it represents war. There's a representation of famine. There's representations of death. And in the midst of the calamity, and this is a beautiful thing that I wanted you all to see. In the midst of the calamity, the day of the Lord comes, people ask, who can stand this? Now, it should remind you, last couple weeks ago, who is worthy? 
Who can stand this? Who is worthy? Those are intended to be paralleled. Who can stand this? And John gets the answer to this question, this little caveat um, in, in this moment. He sees the servants of God enduring persecution. And he is told with his ear, remember, just like he was told, look, there is a lion of Judah. He is told auditorily that there will be 144,000 of them. Now, 144,000 is significant because it's, it's, a, it's a military census. There's 12,000 people from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 people from the tribe of Benjamin, all 12, 12 times 12, right? And so what we have now is that he is creating this military census. So what I want you to see is auditorily he's told an army, the Lion of Judah, but what he sees is not an army. It's an army of people representing all of these tribes, but just like earlier, he is told auditorily the line of Judah. Now he hears one thing and sees an army of martyrs. He sees an army of slain lambs. He sees an army of people who are willing to enact this kingdom, not by military force, not by conflict, but by suffering and laying down their lives. And later on it talks about that they will uh, overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Then seven trumpets blast. It echoes the seven plagues of Exodus. I thought that was significant, and I'm sure, again, we could do so much in-depth study on that, but we just don't have time. But just like Pharaoh, the nations are unwilling to repent, and they must suffer the consequences for that lack of repentance. Chapters 12 through 14 depict two battles. And inside of this moment, it says one is a cosmic spiritual battle. One that takes place kind of behind the scenes is letting us know. Some people would take this as metaphor. Some people would say you're getting a glimpse of the spiritual world behind the physical. Um, And the defeat of the serpent, which is meant to be connected with Genesis, right? The defeat of the serpent and, and, and all the others. And there's this earthly representation where we see this battle that is very much like, it parallels the events that take place in the cosmic battle. This this, uh, represents military power and economic power um, as this enemy that we are fighting against. And all of it's it's wrapped up in this metaphor that we would call Babylon. Now, um, this is a reference to any empire, any earthly world that works in opposition to God. And whether that be Babylon of the era in which the exile took place, whether that be as you move forward Persia, if, if that's Greece and then Rome in Jesus' time and any other regime or earthly system that leverages military power and economic power on this earth, they all get represented by this. So who's the next one? I'm not going to make you answer that. Standing against this regime is a slain lamb and his army of martyrs. It presents this choice, resist Babylon to follow the lamb or follow the beast and the ways of this world and suffer the beast's defeat. Now this brings us to this final set of seven judgments represented by bowls that are being poured out. And and the two things I want you to see from this is that they again echo the seven plagues of Exodus. They are pointing to a final judgment and the bowls conclude with three sets of seven, uh, sorry, all three sets of seven conclude in this moment as Jesus fulfills all of the contents of the, the scroll which he was alone was worthy to open. In the final two chapters before we finish here today, um, once again, Babylon is represented but is metaphorically depicted as a harlot. And it's this, this city that, that becomes the archetype manifestation of all of this evil, representing all of humanity's rebellion, right? Not just specific eras or times, but Babylon is personified by a bloodthirsty queen who is filled with all kinds of wickedness, all kinds of indulgences and evil, and she is eventually defeated, and everyone who stays with her goes down with the ship. All right? Then a final battle happens. Is everyone really like clear as mud right now at this point? It's the best I could do with a uh, summary. Final battle, there's, and this is where one of the big debates, pre- pre-millennial, post-millennial, there's a millennium mentioned in here um, that some things are going to take place. Again, we've told you we don't have a position on this, so I would um, ask you to go ahead and do the research and look it up um, per your interest on this. But what we all agree on is that Jesus wins eventually and the beast is defeated. All of us agree on that. Now, why did I go through the time to do all that? Why have we looked at all of these things? What does all of this mean? 
Well, every bit of this and every single detail is a part of the labor pains that Jesus mentioned. All of it is a part of these events, the timeline, whatever timeline you want to operate under, all of these things, uh, and however you would interpret the interpretables here in uh, in this book, the labor pain serves one purpose that I told you at the very beginning. They describe events that lead to the emergence of something new. They begin to tell us and warn us that a birth is about to take place. The birth of redemption is near, and all of us are called to what? Be prepared. Get our hearts, our minds, our lives in a place where we are ready, just like a real birth, for the labor pains that we're going to walk through and for the baby that is the joy of redemption and the new heavens and new earth. And so my question here is, uh, as we prepare ourselves, as we prepare our hearts, what are you doing with your life today in order to get ready for that? How do we prepare our hearts? And I actually want us to spend just a couple of of moments on that. You can do this in discussion on your own, or we can, um, you know, you can just sit in quiet reflection like we do, but I want you to just sit in wonder of this. How are you preparing yourself for both the labor and the baby? How are you preparing yourself for the trials and tribulations and for the new heavens and the new earth? So let's sit in here for just a few minutes. I'm going to put two minutes up there, and then when we have 30 seconds left. Again, feel free to talk and discuss with those who are around you. Um, But if you just want to kind of think about it, maybe take stock of where you're at, how would you prepare for the labor and the baby? You can reflect and wonder now. Go ahead and put 30 seconds up on the board and we'll continue on with the end of our time together. How would you prepare for the trials, persecution, tribulation? How do you prepare for the baby? The new heavens and new earth. as we close today, I just want to give you a couple of suggestions in terms of preparation. And more so, it's one suggestion for both of these two ideas. But I want you to kind of think of them in categories. How do you prepare for the judgment of the end time events? How do you prepare for the trials, the labor? We're all going to have to be prepared to resist the anti-messiahs of the world, right? But you can't prepare for them if you can't see them. We also must be built up in endurance to persevere in the midst of intense persecution. Maybe you've heard similar stories, but um, I remember being um, overseas in in Malaysia and asking someone how I can pray for them. And I said, hey, I'm going to pray that that these persecution that you're doing, he's about to get, literally, someone was following us. And he told us, you need to go. What's going to happen to you? And he's like, well, I'm going to get beat up by that guy (laughs) just down the street. I'm like, well, if we stay here, he's like, no, 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 you got to go because eventually you're going to be in America and that guy's going to beat me up no matter what because he knows I shouldn't be talking to you. He's realizing I'm I'm at least entertaining. He already knew Jesus, but he's like, that guy knows I'm at least entertaining you all and you're telling me about Jesus. I said, how can I pray for you? And he says, pray that I can endure the persecution. Not that the persecution would stop, I don't want you to pray that. Pray that I have the endurance because we've seen in the scriptures that that produces more fruitfulness. So how do we build up endurance and persevere in the midst of intense persecution? 
We must be prepared to lay down our lives for others. We have to be prepared to engage in spiritual warfare. We have to be prepared to follow the way of the slain lamb. And my directional uh, 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 offering to you is, how did Jesus deal with all of these things? What example did Jesus give us? How do we prepare for the new heavens and new earth? Just like a baby, the bundle of joy is coming, but there's work to be done. So how do you get your hearts and minds ready to the extent that you're in a place of comfort when you land in the new heavens and new earth? I don't mean literally land, by the way. I know there's, that can be kind of a goofy way. But once that is brought into fruition, how will you get yourself in a place where you believe the new heavens and new earth is home to you? And my question, my, my directional input for you is, well, how did Jesus deal with these things? And in some way, I think that answer could almost feel trite. It's not new, but, but what I want you to see is, have you ever done a job, and, and you could have like been offered a class on how to change your oil or how to tile your floor. That's probably a better one. How do you, how do you tile or, ch- or put in wood in your floor, right? Someone could offer that class, but you don't care about that class until you look down and think, I want to I wanna change the tile on my floor. And then all of a sudden, you want to know all the information, right? Then all of a sudden, it's something that you need to know right now. Rarely do we try to just stock a bunch of information in preparation for something we may not deal in. But as soon as you need to change your oil, as soon as you need to get ready for something, all of a sudden it becomes important, and you're looking it up on YouTube. You're calling your friend who did it and messed it up eight different ways so you can avoid all of the eight different mess-ups that that person did, right? How do you prepare for this baby? And what I want you to do is to look at Jesus, read the Gospels in light of the framework we've just talked about. You've read the Gospels, maybe. Maybe you're new to Jesus. I mean, I was new to Jesus, and I had to go through and read these things, and I was completely turned upside down. It wasn't what I thought Jesus was. But now that you have a framework of preparation, go through and read the life of Jesus and ask, how is he preparing How is Jesus getting himself ready for persecution? How is he preparing his heart for and to be the new heavens and the new earth in front of all of these people? And I promise you, now that you have a framework to come back into, now that you have a desire for preparation, you're going to read the scriptures differently. You're going to read the life of Jesus from a different angle. And so I want you to, I want to invite you to read from the scriptures, read from the gospels in a way that will change your paradigm to look for specific things that he is in, in involving himself in. Now, as we get closer um, in our likeness of Jesus, as we get closer and better in our preparation, it's, it's hopeful that our identity begins to be built on a heavenly citizenship, which is what Paul tells us to be. The closer we are to ushering the fullness of the kingdom of God in, the more we are able to participate in this banquet, in the feasting of his goodness, the more we will have the aroma of Christ for the world around us. And so it's not just that we get to become the likeness of Jesus. We actually get to be this heavenly citizenship on the earth now. And the more intense your aroma is, the more your neighbors are going to want to know what's going on. What are you prepping for? What are you preparing your life for? Why, Why are you always giving up your life and sacrificing? Why are you always acting in these ways that kind of seem to be different from the kingdoms of this world? And the more your aroma intensifies, the more they might want to say, What are you prepping yourself for? And that's when you can draw them into an expectation of their own, of preparation for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Would you pray with me? The people of God are given this mandate, Lord. Help us to become prepared not obsessed with details and timelines and all of these things that may or may not work themselves out to fruitfulness, God, but how do we get our hearts drawn into such a powerful, uh, enraptured, um, conscious state that we are wanting to know how you would handle every moment and every situation and every difficulty God, how do we become that glimpse of heaven, Jesus? You were given to us. You became the book to read. You became the how to expect before we are expecting. You became the app and all of the different pieces of these things to help us prepare. You are the Lamaze class for the labors that we are about to walk through. 
And it comes by way of peace that surpasses understanding. It comes by way of, I'm going to answer this like Jesus answers it, not the way my gut reaction wants to answer this. So God, make us heaven people now. Make us heaven kingdom people on earth now. Let us be the, the fruit, the baby before the trials for someone else because you have been that for us. Yeah, God, that we would be consumed by this in a healthy way that bears much fruit. We pray for this right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, as we just continue to worship and we respond to the things that we've just heard and to the scriptures, my prayer always is that you would never be the same on the other side of engaging God's word. And so we engage through singing, which we're about to do together. We engage through giving. We want to give people an opportunity to um, give of your finances, uh, tithes, and offerings. And you can do that physically. There's a box in the back um, for tithes and offerings. But you can also do that online at cgnortheast.com. Um, if you believe in what we're doing here and you want to participate in that, if you call this place your home, then uh, we just want to give you an opportunity to worship God through the giving of your finances. Um, we are available to pray for you. And so I want you to know that we, uh, if you are, uh, need something in terms of prayer today, I would love to pray for you before you head out today. But we also have a group of people um, that, that receives prayers and, and we can pray through, throughout the week for you. And if you just email us at office at cgnortheast.com, we'll get that request and be able to do that. And then finally, we remember, as we do every week, and, uh, you know, not having all of the time to, to really delve into the details, there's a beautiful depiction of the banquet table to come with every tribe, tongue, and nation represented at it. And that's what we look forward to. We look in our history at what Jesus has done so that we can proclaim the future of Jesus' coming. This is what it says in Matthew 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it, new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We believe in uh, an open table, so if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, please feel free to partake of the elements. The table is open.
stand with me as we commission out together. <clears throat> well, as we remind you every morning, we commission out together to know that this uh, time and this building are not the church, but that you are the church, the people of God, and you are sent out every morning to go and make disciples every single week to be the presence of heaven, the presence of the kingdom of God, the presence of the church in every place that you walk, every hallway you step into, every room that you enter, even the Zoom rooms, all right? And so represent him, be the church, the scattered, uh, beautiful bride of Christ. To say once again, happy Mother's Day to those of you who are mothers. Uh, and um, we send you and commission you in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you all so much for being here.